Yes, sir. So yeah, um, you know, he was just just reminiscing over his his prime time. You know what I mean? When 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 he felt like untouchable. You know what I mean? Yeah. He was on fire. He was preaching. People are listening. He's helping the poor. He's doing outreach. Um, he's preaching open air publicly. People are listening. He has a reputable a reputation. Good family. You know, like everything was great. And now, ninety <laughs> percent of his life is destroyed, uh, put upside down. So, but he's reminiscing, you know. He's definitely reminiscing, and uh, we can see here that his friends have forgotten about all that. They, 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 they don't remember that side of him. All of a sudden, Job. All of a sudden, is 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 a wicked man. <laughs> all of a sudden, Job is too prideful. But they forgot when they were sitting there listening to him when he spoke. I said, yo, man, that was some deep stuff you were sharing. I'm, I'm convicted. That was great. Now it's like they forgot about that because this tragedy has happened to him. Chapter 30, Sam. Hello, everyone. I'll be reading from the scriptures as well. Verse 1. But now they laugh at me, those younger than I, whose fathers I would have refused to put with my sheepdogs. Of what use to me is the strength of their hands, since their manhood power has perished. They are dried up from lack and hunger. They flee to a parched land, formerly a waste and ruin. They pluck salt herbs by the bushes and broom tree roots for their food. Verse 5, they were driven out from among men. They shouted at them as at a thief. To dwell in the gullies of, the, of wadis, holes of the ground and clefts. Among the bushes they cry out. Under the nettles they huddled together. Sons of fools, even sons without a name, they have been whipped out of the land. And now I have become their song, and I am a byword to them. Verse 10, they have loathed me, they have kept far from me, and they did not refrain from spitting in my face, because he has loosed my bowstring and afflicted me. They have thrown off restraint in my presence. At my right hand, a brood rises. They pushed away my feet, and they, ri and they raise up against me in their destructive ways. They have broken up my path. They gain by my ruin. No one restrains them. Verse 14, they come as through a wide breach, rushing on me under the ruins. Destructions are turned upon me. They pursue my life as the wind, and my welfare has passed like a cloud. And now my life pours itself out. Days of affliction seize me. My bones have been pierced in me at night, and my gnawings never lie down. By great exertion is my garment changed. It girds me as the collar of my coat throwing me into the mud, and I have become like dust and ashes. Verse 20. I cry out to you, but you do not answer me. I stand up, but you only look at me. You have been cruel to me. With the power of your hand, you oppose me. You lift me up to the wind, making me ride it, and you melt me in a storm. For I have known that you bring me to death and to the house of appointment for all living. Verse 24, yet does not one in a heap of ruin stretch out his hand or in a calamity cry out for help? Did I not weep for him who was in trouble? Was my being not grieved for the poor? When I looked for good, then evil came to me. And when I waited for light, darkness came. My inward parts boiled and did not rest. Days of affliction went before me. I went about blackened, but not by the sun. I stood up in the assembly. I cried for help. I became a brother of jackals and the companion of ostriches. My skin became black upon me and my bones burned with heat. So my lyre becomes mourning and my flute the sound of weeping. Wow. 
Um, I'm wondering in this section here when he says, I cried to you and you didn't answer me, if he's talking to Yahuwah or his friends. Um, you think Yahuwah, the creator? So it's really starting to settle in. He's really starting to feel the, the pain of his situation. Go ahead, Brother D-Rail. All right, I'm just going to sound far out there probably, but I'm just going to say what's on my mind. Uh, verse 23, for I have known that you bring me to death and to the house of appointment for all living. I don't know, when reading that and a few more just made me think of the Messiah. That's all I got. <laughs> That's what I got out of it. That point. You want to elaborate on that point? Uh, like, for you, like he was brought to death, you know, the Messiah for all the living, so they may live for everybody, so so everybody should live. Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying because I, I was thinking the something similar as I was going through this. You know, he's brought me down to my replay and things like that, where you know, Yahushua uh, you did suffer. Um, and seemed to have lost it all in a moment, you know, when he was taken to the to the cross, um, but to rise again, and you know that he walked a, a righteous death. Uh, excuse me, that he lived a righteous life, and that he died a death, and as though he was, you know, like a murderer or, or a thief, like the ones that were beside him, how he got crucified, and just an unjust way, and I demand, but we know that it was all a plan for salvation um, in the end. But I definitely hear your hear your point about it for sure. See. So it's uh, interesting how he went from being the one that was helping to the one that's in need of help and not getting the help that he needs. So it doesn't seem like he's feeling the reciprocation from everything that he has sown. Uh, he's not reaping what he thinks he should be reaping, which, you know, on a human level kind of makes a little bit of sense. Like, Yahoo, I've helped so many people in need my whole life, and now I'm in a place of need and nobody's helping me out. The people who used to listen to me are mocking me. The ones who fled from me because I had so much wisdom on me, the young kids, now they're, they're mocking me. They're promoting my calamity. They're advertising it without help. They're going around and boasting about it and gossiping about me. So that's, that's, that's really tough, man. Really tough. Uh, chapter 31, does anybody want to, anybody hasn't read? Derail, you want to read? Go for it, brother. Chapter 31, ISR, verse 1. I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a maiden? For what is the portion of a law from above at, and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not calamity to, to the perverse and strangeness to the workers of wickedness? Does he not see my ways and number all my steps? If I have walked with falsehood or if my foot has hurried to deceit, let him weigh me in a right scale and let Eloah know my integrity. If my step does turn from the way or my heart has gone after my eyes or if any spot has clung to my hands, let me sow and another eat. And let my harvest be rooted. I just want to highlight that real quick. Verse 8, 7, and 8. All right, verse 9. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, let my wife grind for another and let others bow down over her. Wow. For that would be a wicked scheme and a punishable crookedness. For that, for that would be a fire that burns to my destruction, to, burns to destruction and to a 
and take root among all increase. If I have refused the plea of my male servant or my female servant when they complained against me, then I should, then what should I do when L rises up? And when he punishes, what should I answer him? Verse 15, did not he who made me in the womb make him? And did not one fashion us in the womb? If I have withheld the poor from pleasure or caused the widow's eye to, eyes to fail, or eaten my piece of bread by myself, and the fatherless do not did not eat of it. But from my youth he grew up with me as with a father, and from my mother's womb I guided her. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of garment, or a poor one with, without covering, if his loins have not blessed me and his warm, and he warmed himself with the fleece of my sheep. 21. If I have raised my hand against the fatherless, when I saw I had helped in the gate, let my arm fall from my shoulder and my arm be broken from the bone. For I am in dread of destruction from El, and from his excellence I could not escape. If I have put my trust in gold or called fine gold by gold my refuge, if I have rejoiced because my wealth was great and because my hand had gained much, if I had looked if I have looked at the sun when it shines or the moon when moving in brightness so that my heart has been secretly enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand, <clears throat> 28, that too is a punishable crookedness for I would have denied L above. If I have rejoiced, what's he saying? Like if you looked at the sun and moon, that's like punishable? Whoa, that's, that's pretty interesting. You know how some people go like this, like – you know, they're like, like Catholics and stuff and people that are like, yo, I swear, man, I swear I didn't do anything, you know? Yeah. It's almost like that sounds pegging to me. I don't, I don't know this. I never did the research on it, but he was talking about looking at the sun and the moon and blowing a kiss, almost like people who worship the moon and the, and, and the sun and the stars and stuff, the celestial beings. So it's oh, almost I like, see it. you see that? Yeah. I did, reading and I, I missed that. Yeah. Kiss my hand. Okay. But I almost get it. Like when you know how some people say, yo, man, I swear I didn't do that. Yo, man, I swear. Like they like right. up into the sky. Like they <laughs> maybe that originated from some pagan practice. You know what I mean? Where people did that. They kissed up at the stars and stuff. Yeah. But he's basically saying like, yo, if I sin, basically, if I, if I even, even hinted to trying to worship the sun and the moon, if I even tried to lust after a woman, like, let me reap, let me reap the consequences. Let me reap what I've sown. Like, give me the punishment I deserve. So he's, he's even saying, Father, I, I don't know what sin I committed, but if I've done something wrong, let me have it. You know? Yeah. That's a dangerous prayer. <laughs> that is a <laughs> dangerous prayer. Right. And well, he's not that. afraid. He's not afraid to pray it. All right. All right. What am I at? 29, I think. If I have rejoiced when he who hated me was ruined or lifted myself up when evil found me, him, also I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for a curse on his life. If, if the man of my tent did not say who is there that has not been satisfied uh, with his meat, 32, the stranger did not have to spend the night in the street, for I have opened my doors to the way. If I have covered my transgressions like Adam by hiding my crookedness in my bosom, then let me fear the great crowd and dread the scorn of clans. Then I would be silent and go out of the door. Who would give me a hearing? See my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser, let my accuser write a bill. Would I not take it up on my shoulder, bind it on me for a crown? I would declare to him the number of my steps. I would approach him like a prince. If my land cries out against me or its furrows weep together, if I have eaten its fruit without payment or caused its owner to die, let thistles grow instead of wheat and useless weed instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. Man, he's pretty much saying all these stuff. What have I done? Did I do this? Did I do that? You know? Absolutely. Um, like I said, it's a dangerous prayer, man, because he's now like, 
he's giving Yahoo permission to just, I'm giving you the green light, like destroy me if any of this stuff has been found in me and I didn't know. <laughs> you know, so subcon- another way to look at even it. Even if I subconsciously did some of this. Um, one thing Ken Hovind said, which is pretty funny, he was like, I was, I was in a service and this guy next to me goes up to the altar and says, God, please give me what I deserve. And I started running saying, I don't want to be here when he gives him what he deserves. <laughs> yeah. This is another way to look at, uh, look at things that are, that Yahuwah does not like too. In verse 31, you know, he says a lot of things that he, he would think that Yahuwah would not like. It's good for people to read too, so they know that these are things that Yahuwah detests. You see what I'm saying? Go ahead. I think he became desperate for answers. He was, he was, at, oh, yeah. his, he was at his last talk. talk. He was at his Alamo. You know? <laughs> he said, okay, I'm at the Alamo now. I've done my last soldier. What? What's going on here? Right. Amen. Yeah, I agree. Kind of like when your wife's mad at you and you, she won't tell you what's wrong. <laughs> You're trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. They got they play the quiet, silent game for a couple oh. days. What did I do? Yeah, I like um, 33. Gives us a little, give a little flashback to Genesis, the book of Genesis. 317, Milo's already on it. 37, chapter 3, verse 7. So when Adam and, and Eve uh, committed a transgression in eating from the forbidden tree, they tried to hide from Yahuwah. And then there was the physical uh, metaphor to their what they were doing was they made clothes out of plants. And they were trying to aka cover themselves up and uh they realized they were naked so and that's that's a that's a metaphor to they 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 realized that their sin was exposed or what they did wrong was now uh visible what chapter and verse was that Genesis? chapter three verse seven yeah, the physical thing was them actually physically Physically, they noticed they were naked, but also they realized what they did. So it was like a physical and a spiritual at the same time. The physical aspect was they were physically naked, so they got fig leaves. And uh, it's interesting because you keep on reading in that chapter, Yahuwah um, gives them real clothes to put on. And we could hint that that's the start of the sacrificial system, that that Yahuwah had an animal being sacrificed so they could have real um, coverings. Yeah, I like the theory. This is just a, just to have some fun thoughts. But I have a theory that before they sinned, they were clothed with some type of glorious covering. You know, they had like some kind of radiant body of light, body of light or something on them. Uh, you know, not like we've seen in movies. Like they make it look like they're just walking around naked and just were okay with it. But I think perhaps they had something covering their, their bodies, you know, that was beautiful and glorious and spiritual. And then they covered it with something physical, earthly. And, uh, but the coolest thing is that the father was merciful on their sin and he clothed them after he gave them, you know, their punishments and everything. He's like, you know, even though you guys did this, I'm going to give you clothes. I like that. I, I was, when you're just saying, that, I was thinking maybe like, like when you're looking at the ocean, the reflection of the light beaming, like something around them, like sparkly, where they couldn't see their actual nakedness, that kind of like clothing or something. Yeah, that's kind of what I what I was hearing when I heard these kind of uh, theories and stuff. I'm like, huh, that's interesting. I could see that happening. You know, if if Satan could disguise himself as as a you know light, you know, why wouldn't Yahuwah cover his his children? And right. Stuff? glorious you know what i mean so anyway i just wanted to give my theory since we're on theories i believe our original bodies were light not fleshy bodies that's just my personal opinion i think that adam and eve and yahuwah in the garden were all light 
they were just like beams of light. And when sin entered, that's how we got these fleshy bodies. Like it's a consequence. Like we, that, I mean, I can't show a verse for it, but I don't know. To me, I always believe that, you know, this is like the type of bodies we have now is kind of part of the consequence of sin. All right. Let's move on. Next chapter. I'll read chapter 32. Making some good progress here. Chapter 32, I'm reading from the web. <clears throat> so these three men ceased to answer Job. Hallelujah. They shut their mouths finally. Because he was righteous in his own eyes. Hmm. That sounds bad. Yeah, no use of talking to him since he's prideful. Then the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, of the family of Ram, was kindled against Job. His wrath was kindled because he justified himself rather than God. So I'm going to say that's what they think. Verse uh, 3, also his wrath was kindled against his three friends because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Now Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were elder than he. When Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, his wrath was kindled. Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzai answered, I am young and you are very old. Therefore, I held back and didn't dare show you my opinion. I said, days should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man and the spirit of the almighty gives them understanding. It is not the great who are wise nor the aged who understand justice. Therefore, I said, listen to me. I also will show my opinion. <laughs> Verse 11, here we go. Behold, I waited for your words and I listened for your reasoning while you searched out what to say. Yes, I gave you my full attention, but there was no one who convinced Job or who answered his words among you. Beware lest you say, we have found wisdom. God may refute him, not man. For he has not directed his words against me, neither will I answer him with your speeches. Verse 15. They are amazed. They answered no more. They don't have a word to say. Shall I wait because they don't speak, because they stand still and answer no more? I also will answer my part, and I will also show my opinion, for I am full of words. The spirit within me constrains me. Behold, my breast is as wine, which has no vent. Like new wineskins, it is ready to burst. I don't understand that language, guys. He's holding his peace and now it's his time to speak. Basically, that's what he's saying. If he was in front of me speaking like that, I'd be like, what are you saying, bro? Verse 20. I will speak that I may be refreshed. I will open my lips and answer. Please don't let my respect, please don't let me respect any man's person. Neither will I give flattering titles to any man. Wow. I wish people would practice that today. Pastor Reverend Bishop, most highest, excellent doctor, doctor PhD. Verse 22, for I don't know how to give flattering titles or else my maker would soon take me away. I'm going to read the next chapter. Anybody got anything they want to say? All right, let's flow right into it. See what this guy has to say. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. My bad. However, Job, uh, chapter 33, however, Job, please hear my speech and listen to all my words. Verse 2, see now, I have opened my mouth, my tongue has spoken in my mouth. My words will utter the uprightness of my heart. That which my lips know, they will speak sincerely. The spirit 
of God, of Elohim, has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. If you can answer me, set your words in order before me and stand up. Behold, I am toward God, even as you are. I am also formed out of the clay. Behold, my terror will not make you afraid, neither will my pressure be heavy on you. Surely you have spoken in my hearing. I have heard the voice of your word, saying, I am clean without disobedience. I am innocent, neither is there iniquity in me. Behold, he finds occasions against me. He counts me for his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks. He marks all my paths. Behold, I will answer you. In this you are not just, for God is greater than man. Why do you strive against him? Because he doesn't give account of any of his matters. For God speaks once, yes, twice, though man pays no attention. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men and slumbering on the bed, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and high pride from man. He keeps back his soul from pit, from the pit, and his life from perishing by the sword. He is chastened or disciplined also with pain on his bed, with continual strife in his bones, so that his life abhors bread and his soul dainty food, whatever dainty means. His flesh is so consumed away that it can't be seen. His bones that were not seen stick out. Yes, his soul draws near to the pit and his life to the destroyers. Verse 23, if there is beside him an angel, an interpreter, one among a thousand to show to man what is right for him, then God is gracious to him and says, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. His flesh will be fresher than a child's. He returns to the days of his youth. He prays to God, and he is favorable to him, so that he sees his face with joy. He restores the man. He restores to man his righteousness. He sings before men and says, I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it didn't profit me. He has redeemed my soul from going into the pit. My life will see the light. Behold, God does all these things twice, yes, three times with a man, to bring back his soul from the pit, that he may be enlightened with the light of the living. So this friend is basically saying, from what I'm understanding is, Yahuwah allows people to go through this calamity so they can repent from their wickedness so you can bounce back and be redeemed. Is that, am I correct? Are you guys seeing something different? Anybody seeing anything different? I'm seeing that, but also more than that. I'm seeing, he's saying to Job, listen, I understand that you are righteous in everything, but in the sight of Yahuwah, no man is pure, basically meaning that we can't be sin, we can't be taking a cause of the Almighty sin. We haven't done anything wrong. That's pretty much what he's saying. He's saying um, in verse 10, who is picking a quarrel with me, and he considers me his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks and watches my every move. But you are wrong, and I will show you why. For Yahuwah is greater than any human being. So why are you bringing a charge against him? Why say he does not respond to people's complaints? For Yahuwah speaks again and again, though people do not recognize it. So that's kind of like Yahuwah's voice. Like a lot of times we don't realize. destruction is his voice? Calamity is his voice? Well... Sometimes we don't understand the frequency of his voice. Sometimes we're listening to another voice. So what he could be hinting to is that sometimes we're, you know, sometimes we don't listen to what he's trying to tell us. All right. We'll see what Yahuwah has to say because he will speak later on in this book. Hey, verse 13 would have been a good one for me. I was talking to this atheist. <laughs> all, he do, all he did was... Uh, Curse, curse Yahuwah, and there was no getting through to him, but it was like, why do you strive against him? Because he doesn't give you account of any of his matters. But I've seen the devil working through him, too, while we were talking. Uh, two things. One that's interesting when you say he curses Yahuwah because 
if you don't believe in him and he doesn't exist, then you can't curse nothing. So that's pretty interesting. Um, that's why I said he, what he. That's why I was saying when I told him that because he was trying to quote scripture too, and I said even the devil quoted scripture. Mm -hmm. He's letting himself be known. You know, mm -hmm. the devil was showing himself because he said, "How do you know the devil didn't write the scriptures?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Uh, the shame, the shame they're blinded. Um, the only thing I got from this one in particular was verse thirteen says, "Why do you strive against him? For he gives not account of any of his manners, of his matters. For L speaks once." twice and that proceeds not its own I don't know if this is right, but nevertheless it, it sounded like, you know, you're going on and on and on, but why how do I say it? Like Yahuwah speaks but men just don't pay attention. So even in even in this matter, you're you're saying, you know, you're righteous and all this, but maybe you're not even listening to Yahuwah. Maybe you're not even hearing what he said. Maybe he already answered you and you're still not paying attention. Um so why are you keep why do you keep on going on? It's almost kind of like what Doug's point was within the past few weeks. Like why do you keep questioning the way that you are questioning? Um, I'm going to read the last three verses real quick. Verse thirty one. Mark well, Job, and listen to me. Hold your peace, and I will speak. So you shut up now and let me speak. If you have anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. That's weird. If not, listen to me, hold your peace, and I will teach you wisdom. We'll see about that. I'm curious to see what Yahuwah has to say. Uh, anybody want to read chapter 34? We probably don't have time in this session. We only got seven minutes left. Um, yeah, this is a long chapter, so we might as well. Anybody have any thoughts real quick before we end this session so far? Mine is interesting, verse 23. <laughs> but if an angel from heaven appears a special messenger to in intercede for a person and declare that he is upright, he will be gracious and say, rescue him from the grave. Right? That? That's verse Verse 23 to 24 of chapter 33. It says, For I have found a ransom for his life, then his body will become as healthy as a child's firm and youthful again. So I just found that interesting. All right. Going once, going twice. Anybody got any last words? Nope. <laughs> All right.